G'day Jaff Adventures and welcome to the channel. Today we're going to run through some routine maintenance items that you can do at home with your car. So if your car is in warranty, I'd recommend you continue to get a trade qualified mechanic to look after it so that you don't have any dramas with Toyota. Because we all know if Toyota can find a way to get out of a warranty issue, they absolutely will. They're real buggers like that. But let's assume that your car is outside of warranty. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to be able to do simple service items and you can save yourself a matzo doing it and then you've got the peace of mind that it's been done right. So today I'm going to talk about an oil change in your Land Cruiser and with some very basic tools you can do this yourself. Whether you feel that you're competent and swinging a spanner or not, trust me, back yourself, you can do this. It's not that difficult. So stay tuned and let's run through this together. So the first question is service interval. And in our particular example, how often do I need to do an oil change? The warranty and service manual will tell you that. And it specifies under normal operating conditions every 10,000 kilometers. Now because I never do what I'm told, just ask my wife, I actually do services every 5,000 kilometers. And I have done that for years and years. Now you might think that that's overkill, especially with Toyota saying you can do it every 10. But listen, for me, it's all about peace of mind. I've done 5,000 intervals for my entire life on all of my vehicles, regardless of the specification, and I've never had a mechanical failure with the engine in my car. So that being the case, I'm going to stick with my 5,000 kilometers and I'm going to sleep well at night. What you end up doing, it's really up to you. It's whatever you're comfortable with. So now we've established we need to do an oil change. The next question is, how much oil do I need? And what type of oil do I use? And that's where your owner's manual comes into play. Now mine's a 2010 model and on page 411 in the owner's manual it gives you the specifications that you need. And it's telling me a diesel engine with the filter is 9.2 liters. And you know what? I have never ever 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 done an oil change without changing the filter. That just flies in the face of logic to me. The filter catches all the crap you put fresh oil in and you leave the old oil filter in there, that crap's just going to leach back into the motor again. So my recommendation is, regardless of what your interval is, make sure you change the filter with the oil. So 9.2 liters. Next question, what type of oil do I get? Now I'm not going to get into a discussion on brands, but let's just talk about oil specifications and what you should use. And again, your owner's manual is a great guide for that. So this is telling me for the diesel motor that I should use an oil grade of an API CF4 or API CF. And if you get your oil, whatever your brand is, and have a look on the back, it will give you the industry specifications that it runs to. And that particular oil does meet the API CF standard. So bang, we'll use that one for me. Next question is viscosity. Again, your owner's manual has a lovely little graph on there that will help you identify what oil is best for you. The rough guide is if you're in colder climates or if you're in the cold season, winter time for example, you tend to run slightly lighter engine oils than you do in hot conditions or in summer conditions. Toyota is specifying a 5W30 is the best choice for fuel economy and good starting in cold weather. You know what? I live in Queensland. We don't get cold weather here. It's an unusual occurrence if it gets down to zero here. So that's the reason that I've gone with a slightly thicker engine oil rated for slightly hotter conditions. So I've gone with a 15W40 and if you look on Toyota's little chart, it says a 15W40 is specified for the coldest temperature of around about minus 10 all the way up to 100 degrees C. No way in God's green earth is it going to get to minus 10 here for me, especially coming into summer now. So 15W40 is what I'm going to use. What you should use will be really dependent on where you live and the temperatures that you're going to experience. So just have a look at that little chart and make your call on this viscosity of oil that you would like to get dependent on those temperatures. So step number one, we've popped our bonnet. 
What I do is I typically run the car and warm the motor up. That just allows the oil to flow out a little bit easier. Right now I've got a cold car, so I'm gonna kick her in the guts. I'm just gonna idle it for five odd minutes just to get some heat into the engine oil so that it'll drop out easier. If you've got a hot motor already, you can get stuck straight into it. Now the next thing I'm going to do, and it's optional for you, is I'm going to remove this cover. And the reason that I do that is I just want to get a little bit more light down there where the filter is located. To pop this off is dead easy. These little clips have a push button in the center of them. So you just push that center button in, and they simply pop out like that. Push the center down, lift the panel, out it pops. As easy as that. And it's always interesting when you pull these covers off. You never know what sort of flora and fauna you're going to find. I've got a dragonfly. Lovely. In the intercooler, I've got a uh, viceroy butterfly, or a monarch for those in Canada. And there's a cabbage looper in there as well. So, quite a collection. So we've got our cover off. Our next step is to remove the bash plates underneath the car. Now I'm very lucky in that I've got a hoist so I can jack the car up. If you don't have a hoist then obviously you've got to crawl down under there on your back but your car is high enough that you're not going to have the chassis on the end of your nose anyway. Alright we've got our car in the air or you're laying on the ground whatever the case may be and you need to pull these bash plates off. I've got an ARB bar and this is an ARB bash plate fitted to it so I've got to take that bash plate off to get to the bolts on this one. And this bash plate is held on with six 10 millimeter bolts. All right, now that we've got the ARB bash plate off, we can actually take off these Toyota factory bash plates. And there we have it, bash plate off. Now at this point, you could pull up stumps if you wanted to. You don't have to pull this other bash plate off, the second half of the bash plate. Because see here, you can access the oil filter, no problem. And this plastic bash plate here, if you simply take these two bolts off, that little hatch comes off and you can get to the sump plug. I'm going to pull all of the bash plates off because when I'm doing a service, I like to see up underneath there whether I've got any oil drips, etc. It allows me to view and access the underside of the engine and I'd like to see what's going on in there. Okay, now the icky part. We've got to drop the oil out of the sump. That's a 14 mil bolt there. I put on some rubber gloves to protect my beautiful hands from getting covered in black diesel pus. Now let's drop the oil. There we have it. Black gold, Texas tea. Now while that's draining, let's have a chat about this oil filter cartridge here. And you might be saying, hey Terry, I've got a 200 series, but mine doesn't look like that. And you'd be right. Your 200 series oil filter housing will probably look like this. It's a Bakelite type material. Now I've replaced mine only because I'm not a fan of this type of material, especially out in the bush. If I'm doing an oil change out in the bush and I happen to crack this thing, it's a showstopper, it's a disaster. You can't run your motor. So I said, there's gotta be a better way. And you know what? The 79 series cruisers, which have the same motor in them, have a aluminum filter housing. I don't know why they've got the two different housings on the two different cars, but anyway, that's, that's something for the Toyota geniuses to figure out. So I've replaced mine with that aluminum housing. So, if you're looking to do that yourself, there's the genuine Toyota part number. Just hop down to your local dealer, say you want one of those puppies, and get rid of your Bakelite cap. So let's talk about what you get in your oil filter kit. Obviously, you get an oil filter, that's a given. You get two O-rings, the large one goes on the outside diameter of the filter housing, and this little one goes into a drain valve. You'll also get one of these things. Now here's what you're meant to do with this thing. 
That is a simple 3 8 square. So you can actually fit a 3 8 ratchet in there. And you're meant to unscrew that plug and then pop this little sucker up in the hole once that's unscrewed. That pushes the filter up and allows you to drain that housing. That has never friggin' worked for me ever, anytime I've ever tried it. So if I try and undo that there, it simply spins off the entire filter housing. No matter how loose I set that thing up, um, it tends to turn that entire filter housing. So what does that mean? It just means when you take your filter housing off, you get oil that kind of gloops around the outside of it. Be great if that worked, but like I said, it's never worked for me. Now here's a Toyota special tool, it's called. Um, and I highly recommend getting one of these, especially if you've got that Bakelite filter housing. And it's basically a cap, a multi-sided cap, that fits up over the filter housing and allows you to unscrew it on all of these multiple pressure points. There's the part number there if you're interested in it. I think I picked mine up off of eBay actually, but no doubt you could get them through Toyota as well. All right, our oil is done draining. So we'll pop our sump plug back in and we'll torque it to specification. Uh, uh, done. I like to spray a little bit of carby cleaner on it when I'm done. Just helps show up leaks if you've got any. Okay, we'll move on to our filter housing now and I'll show you exactly what I mean when we try and take that center cap out. It never comes out. Oh, unfreaking believable. That is the first time that's ever happened for me. Far out. Okay, let's go get that little bit of plastic then. So this is what it's meant to do. You got that little bit of plastic, you pop him up in there, and that's meant to drain all of the oil out of your filter housing. So it doesn't gloop down the sides on you. Unfreaking believable. It actually worked. Fair income. that's the first time that's ever happened for me. Well, I must admit I'm not a fan of these things. Uh, it's been five minutes, it's still got oil dripping out of it. Had I just taken the filter off and allowed it to gloop everywhere, I would have been done in 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm not a fan of those at all. I don't think I'd use that anyway, even if I could get it off every time. Now it's time for our filter tool. Didn't matter anyway. Still glooped everywhere. All right. All right, we've got our filter housing on the bench. So, take that off. That's our Toyota tool. Set that aside. And there's our filter housing with the old element in it. A couple of things to note. You got two O-rings. That one there and that one there. We'll take both of those O-rings off and we'll replace them with the new ones that came in the kit. The filter just clicks in. So you remove your filter like that. So there's your bare housing ready to go. Now we'll take our carby cleaner and I'll give that a good cleaning. We'll remove and discard our O-rings. There's one of them. And there's the second one. There we go, that housing is pretty bloody clean. <laughs> I'll dry him off with a rag and we'll hit it with some compressed air, and dry it out completely. Okay, back on the bench. Our housing is all nice and clean and dry. First thing we'll do is replace that O-ring. So you go to your kit, you pull out your O-ring, get a little bit of oil and lubricate that O-ring up. Pop them in that groove like so, and we get our plug, which I've also cleaned, and we run that plug down. And there we have it. We'll tighten that plug properly when it's on the car. Now this O-ring, the larger of the two, goes in that groove there. And you got to make sure you get that in the right groove, because that's very important. Again, we'll put a little bit of oil on that, and we'll pop him over into the right groove. So you see that? You might go, oh yeah, that's sweet. It's exactly where she goes. You'd be wrong. It's that one groove 
right there. Very important you get that one right. And last but not least, we've got our filter element. And that simply slides over and clicks down. You can hear a little bit of a click. It's super important that that perforated bit is there and that that clicks down properly. Because if that's missing, when the engine's running, that filter will collapse in on itself and it'll actually starve the engine of oil. You get real low oil pressure. So very, very important that that perforated metal bit is there and that that is clicked down over top of it. And that's it. That's the assembled housing ready to go back into the car. Now we'll just get our rag and clean this oil housing area. That's it. That is now ready to receive our filter unit. It just pops up in there and threads in. Now your Bakelite unit will be exactly the same as this, just different material obviously. Now we'll tighten that down and there's a small detent clip. You can't see it, it's on the back side of this housing, but there's a small detent clip that it hits and that tells you that it's seated. And the other thing we'll do is tighten up that plug. And there we have it. That oil filter housing is now back on and in place. We're ready to throw some engine oil in. Now that we've got our oil filter housing installed, you might think we'll put the bash plates back on. I actually like to fill the engine with engine oil first and run it for a few minutes while the bash plates are off just to make sure that I haven't got any leaks. So that's what I'll do next. I'll drop the car and fill her up with some oil. The other thing that I've got fitted is an oil catch can. And the drain is just behind this panel here on the passenger side. Wheel well. So I'll pull this panel off and I'll drain that catch can. Again, I do that every 5,000 kilometers with the regular service. Now what I've done is I've put a drain hose on the bottom of my catch can and just put a bolt in there with a small washer. And there we go. Drain away Mr. Catch Can. I normally get 40 or 50 milliliters out of it every 5,000 K, which I think is pretty normal. I've heard people report sort of 100 mil for 10,000 K. All right, that's all drained, so we'll put our bung bolt back in. And there we have it, 40 mil, pretty much bang on. And that is black, black toxic pus. And that would have gone right back in through the intake system. And there's what that oil looks like out of the catch can. Just black toxic pus. Take the filler cap off, fill her up with some oil. I got one of these cheap, super cheap auto funnels. And what I like about this funnel is it actually threads in to the drain hole or to the filler hole. Alrighty. This is a 10 liter oil can and I took out what I think was about 700 mil, dipped it into a different can. So there should be 9.3 liters in this one. All right, we've got the engine oil in the engine now. The cap's back on. We'll kick her in the guts and build up some oil pressure. Let it idle for 30 seconds to a minute. Shut it down and then we'll check the oil on the dipstick. Check our oil pressure. And here it comes. Looking good. Beautiful. Exactly where we'd like to see it when it's idling cold. When it's hot and running, it sits down about the quarter mark. So we let the car sit for a few minutes. Let the oil drain back down into the sump. We'll dip her now. So you want it between those two lines and we're just marginally overfilled. I'm pretty comfortable with that. Right, we'll check the underside for any leaks. Around our oil filter looks good. No problem there. Around our sump plug looks good as well. All right, we can put our bash plates back on and we're done. All right, I'll enter the details in the logbook and that oil change is finished and that portion of the service is done. What I hope this shows you guys is that you don't need to be a mechanic. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to be able to change the oil. I know for some people who don't swing wrenches all that often, it can be a little bit intimidating. 
but just follow those steps take it easy take it nice and slow you'll get through it no dramas whatsoever all you need are these simple tools that I've got laid out here in front of you. So the next time we meet for one of these little mini services, I'll change the fuel filter and we'll go through step by step how to do that. And again, that job is dead easy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging around. Keep the shiny side up, everybody. We'll see you next time in the shed.